So anyway, I hope you enjoy the meditation here. Sometimes I always think that's the best part of a Friday night, just to be able to sit and have a guided meditation, learn how to be peaceful and calm. Anyone outside who wishes to come in, you're always welcome to come in or go out at any time. I know that sometimes people need to go to toilets. So please don't go in here. Toilets <laughs> outside. But anyhow, so for this evening's talk, you know, I, I still keep the same old process of never actually planning anything. Because actually as I teach, so I, I live, so I practice. These are guidelines for me. And I just do notice that you may plan to teach something, but then it all goes wrong. How many times in your life have things always gone wrong? Actually, when you don't plan anything, nothing can go, can go wrong. <laughs> Everything goes according to a plan, which is not there in the first place. And I like it when you don't have too many plans. You can expect anything to happen. Who knows what's going to happen? Oh, there's a, a monk in the back. You're not a monk. Oh, you uh, dressed like one. Minister. Minister. Oh, okay. Hey, minister. Yeah, do you want to take a seat or are you just taking photographs? Okay. I just have to check you're not from ACO or CIA or. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course you can take photographs. But please make sure you're comfortable. <laughs> So, but anyway, when things, what's the worst thing can ever happen to me? I sometimes think. And sometimes, you know, that maybe I might say something wrong or do something wrong and find out I'm ending up in jail. Have you ever been in jail? I've been in jail many times. Not be <laughs> visiting, <laughs> yes, right, visiting and teaching. And sometimes when I've gone into a jail visiting and teaching, sometimes I look at those places, they're very comfortable. In fact, it's much more comfortable in a prison than in Bodhinyana Monastery. And I still remember the case of this monk. He was a Thai monk, Venerable Tape Siddhi Muni, a very senior. He was number three in the hierarchy of Thailand at the time. And because he was number three, the monk who was number two, uh, no, he was actually number two in the hierarchy. And the monk who was number three was jealous. He wanted to sort of eventually become the head monk of Thailand. I don't know why anyone would ever like to be the head of anything. <laughs> Buddha Society of WA is an exception. <laughs> but anyway, that the number two monk was a good monk, number three monk was a little bit more dodgy. And so he concocted this, um, this criticism of the senior monk, of the number two monk. Because you hear what I say every week, and sometimes it's so easy to you know, put, say something, and out of context people record that part, add another part to it, and they can think you're all sorts of weird terrorists. Because, you know, I, sometimes I say, I am a terror now. A Maha terror, Giga terror, whatever you call it. And next year, 50th reigns, then you become a terror terror. And then say, well, Ajahn Brahma admits this, he's, he's into terror. And it could all be <laughs> a terrorist. Sometimes that people think, you know, that how you say things like when I was in Penang recently, when I was in Penang, uh, one of the people, he was a translator of one of my talks. He was also a very senior doctor. And he said, Ajahn Brahm, I think I'd, I offer you, can I give, do you some blood tests? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, no, I think I need to give you a health check. When was the last time you had a health check, he asked me. And I said, an hour ago. <laughs> this was at night time. What hospital was that? And I said, my health checks, and I was being serious about this. My health checks as I go into meditation, and I become so aware of my body, my own body, 
I know exactly how it feels and how it is. And any parts of it which have got some sort of disease or some sort of injury, some sort of obstruction, I can feel that straight away. I spent years of my life getting to know my own body in a way probably much more than any of you sitting in front of me. I know it really well. So I can know when there's something wrong somewhere. So what I was saying was not some sort of joke to avoid going to see a doctor. It was actually very true. I said I last had a checkup the last time I was meditating and everything felt really good. And it was a different way of talking. So sometimes I could maybe get sent to jail like that because you say, oh Ajahn Brahm told us we don't know to go and see a doctor. And that's not what I'm meaning. I'm saying if you've got deep meditation and you know your body, then fair enough. But if you don't know your body as well as I know it, and something's happening, then please go see doctor. But nevertheless, what I was saying there, it can be misconstrued sometimes. You know, a lot of times, you know, even as a Buddhist, you know, I say it's so important to you know, be friendly and to respect people from all types of religion. And you know those stories which I've told, you know, some of these stories I've told so many times that many of you may be forgetting them. You know, one of the stories I told years ago was the old man who just uh, uh, was working in the mountains, you know, as a farmer, and you know, spent so much time working hard like many of you do, to send your children to good hospital, to good schools so they can get a good education. So many parents sacrifice their lives for the education of their children. And the children did really well. And once they'd established themselves in the city, that's when they, they invited their father to come and visit a big city for the first time. So the father saw this huge city for the very first time in his life. And as he was walking through the city, that's when the father, this old man, heard this sound. It was such an awful noise. But still the father said, I come here to learn what's going on in this city. So he followed the noise to its source. And there, in a little room of a house, he saw a young boy trying to play a violin. Have any of your children ever learnt the violin? When they first start playing it, oh crikey, you just want to get earplugs in your ears. But you still say, oh very good son, carry on. But this young man, this old man, so he didn't understand, he said, wow, what a terrible noise that is. I never want to hear a violin ever again. But of course, that afternoon, different part of the town, he heard this beautiful sound. It was so melodious and thrilling. He went to see its source and he found in another room of another house, there was this old lady playing a violin. She was a maestro. She spent all her life learning how to play this instrument. And it was gorgeous what she was playing. And only then did the man realize, the old man realize, it wasn't the violin's fault. It was the person who hadn't learned how to play it properly yet. And with the wisdom which simple people often have, he realized that's the same with religions or spirituality in this world. It's very easy to criticize Buddhists, Catholics, Muslims, Jews in this world. But I think a lot of time it's just a person hasn't yet learned how to play their path of spirituality in a proper way, in a beautiful way. They're still learners, not maestros. One of the advantages I have of being a senior Buddhist monk is that you do meet people from other religions, other paths. 
And when I do meet them, you have great conversations. And some of those people from these other paths you meet, and you really respect them. They've learnt a lot how to play their spirituality. And you feel very comfortable you know, hanging out with them, doing things with them. And one of those people, his you know, dear old friend, unfortunately he's dead now, was the abbot of the, uh, the Benedictine monastery over in Eunorcia. He was a good mate. And I remember he was the, the abbot, the Catholic, and when I went to visit him, you know, he gave me a tour around the, the, one of the oldest buildings in Western Australia. And I couldn't help but ask him. He said, these buildings are really old. Are there any ghosts in here? Because I'm really into ghosts. I like ghosts. And he said, no. Catholics don't believe in ghosts. That's what he told me. I don't know if that was right, but he was an abbot, so you've got to believe him. And I said, really, you don't believe in ghosts? He said, no, we don't believe in ghosts. And I prodded him in the chest. What about the Holy Ghost then? And he said, oh, Ajahn Brahm, you've got me again. So he became a good friend. But one of the things he said to me, you know, this was, he was a Catholic, I was a Buddhist. We respected each other, even though I didn't always agree with him. He didn't always agree with me. And I said, he said to me once that one of his core beliefs, this is how he put it, is that everyone is searching for God. Now, please, watch your mind, don't react. I'm not being a weird Buddhist monk. I am a Buddhist. And, but then I respected what he said. And years later, there was this incident where we were co-presenting at University of WA at a, a chaplaincy conf uh, conference. And I was teamed up with this Abbot Placid, so we can say, to this, you know, how do Buddhists and Christians actually help people? And then in the audience at that time, you probably recognize the story now, one of the people in the audience was quite a well-known intellectual, that was Father Frank Brennan. He was a Jesuit and he was just so well regarded, he was actually selected to do an amendment to the Australian Constitution for human rights. And so, you know, he was no lightweight. So when he asked a question, I realized a joke wouldn't cut it with people like that. <laughs> You know, I tell lots of jokes, but nevertheless, you know, like about the ghost and the Holy Ghost, do you believe in ghosts? But nevertheless, the question which he asked, which was one which many people may ask you, you know, that many people believe in a God. What do Buddhists think about God? Now, straight away, you can possibly say, Buddhists don't accept the existence of a creator God. You, a other being doesn't have autonomy over you. But that really wasn't going to take a conversation any deeper. So what I answered to this Father Frank Brennan, I said, well look, this Abbot Placid, you know, we are friends. He's the only Abbot I can talk to in Australia about Abbot business. <laughs> and actually we did that at the time. Whenever there was any visitors, sometimes there were some visitors a bit on the edge uh, emotionally. And you know, they would go to our monastery, Bodhinyana, first for a few days, and they'd go to New Norsey. I said, how do you deal with such people? We can't say no to them, but we can't let them stay very long. So we exchange names, lists of people. If they ask to come to Bodhinyana Monastery, or they ask to go to New Norsey Monastery, look out for these. It was like a secret blacklist. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that's what we did. <laughs> but anyhow, I said, well look, this is my friend from a different religion. And he was always telling me that, you know, that that was his belief. Everyone is searching for God. So I'm not going to question that. I'm going to ask, how does that, what does that mean for me? 
as a Buddhist monk all my life. Why am I a Buddhist monk? What do I search for? Each one of you who comes here on a Friday evening or just one off, I don't care, what do you search for when you come here? What brings you here? What motivates you in your life? What do you want in life? What gives it meaning? What propels you in this life? What do you want? What are you searching for? And then I said, well, all the Buddhists which I know, they're all searching for peace, peace of mind. Let's take that even deeper. They're searching for this wonderful compassion and kindness. It's one of the reasons why when anybody comes in here, please, you're always welcome. And if you feel a little bit discomforted, get another cushion, lean against the wall, go outside and sit on the grass, whatever you need to go. And if you need to go to the toilet, go to the toilet. You won't miss anything. Everything is recorded. And, and if you can come and go, your names are never taken. Which means that you feel like free. There's no sort of, you're not going to ask you for anything here. Just like those times when people... <laughs> now this is true. This, it could be a joke, but I don't make these jokes up. People called. They phoned, are you giving the talk tonight? Ajahn Brahm said, yes. And they said, how much do you charge? They don't know anything about our center. How much do you have to pay to get in? How much did you pay to get in tonight? Nothing. And they said, that's what I said. We don't have to pay anything. And they said, you don't have to pay anything. I said, no. I said, well, you can't be any good then. And she hung up. <laughs> I never got offended, I thought it was such a funny attitude. <laughs> so these days, of course, I never say that anymore. When people ring up, how much does it cost to come into this centre on a Friday evening? And I answered, priceless. <laughs> Which is a much better, just because you don't have to pay anything doesn't mean it's not worth anything. Right? Priceless is the perfect answer. You don't pay anything, but it doesn't mean it's not worth anything. I think I can say this story as well now. I just always got to be a bit careful I don't get into trouble with the library. But in the old days, you know, many people would like to have a Buddha statue for their house. You know, you become a Buddhist and you, you get inspiration from having a Buddha statue. And so we used to have all these old Buddha statues which we would just, people would give us. We just put them in the library on the top of the shelves. And then people would come up and say, you know, they want a Buddha statue for their shrine at home, something to inspire them, something to remind them of the beautiful teachings. Where can we get one? I said, well, look, go to the library, you see, I think they've all been removed now. Go to the library, you can see those Buddha statues over there, you know, on the shelves. So I take them in there, and they say, well, that's a nice one. And they say, how much is that? <laughs> and you know the answer, priceless. Yeah, but how much is it? It's priceless. But how much do I have to pay? You like it? It's yours. And there's a beautiful way of doing things. Because those ones are given to us. Sometimes people have extra or they're moving somewhere and they can't take it with them. They put it on top there. And it's given for free. No charge. But it's priceless. Don't think it's just to be thrown away. And that's kind of a beautiful way. It's, it's not the way that things are usually done in other shops, but it's a gorgeous way of doing things. It's generous, it's kind, but I just want to make sure that people take those Buddha statues because they really like them. How many of you like the Buddha statue behind me? If you can take it away with your own hands, you can have it. <laughs> Which is impossible. <laughs> Actually, it's not impossible. You know, that's some of the things I've seen in my life as a monk. When we started our monastery over in, I'm just going all over the place in these talks, which is my common practice. So when we started this monastery over in northeast Thailand, of course you need a Buddha statue. So one was offered and maybe it was a big one, about you know, the size of this behind me here. And it arrived at the station, which was maybe about 
six kilometers away from the monastery. How do we get it from the station to the monastery? Yes, of course you could get a truck from town, but that's not the way it works over in uh, Buddhist Northeast Thailand. The lay people were told in the village the statues, statue has arrived. And then about an hour later, I was told, I was only a young monk at the time, come out to the front of the monastery, have a look, see what's going on. All the villagers they were all carrying by hand this enormous Buddha statue. Maybe we had about 20 men under the Buddha statue. When one got tired, another one would take their place. And they carried it all the way from the station, six kilometers over the paddy fields, over the road, to the monastery. And they were shouting and laughing and having a wonderful time. And you knew that Buddha statue would never fall because it was a lovable thing to do. And they were doing this because this was their monastery, they wanted to see a Buddha statue actually come in there. It was a gorgeous thing to see. As an engineer, sort of, you know, you think that's impossible. If you had public health and safety, <laughs> they, would have <laughs> they would have said, no, you can't do that. But they did it, and it was just a beautiful sort of act of kindness. But anyway, going back to um, the question, what are you searching for in life? That's one of the things which you do search for. Instead of everything being so regulated, please excuse me, and so official, you have to do it this way, you can't do it that way, you must do it you know, according to this way. How does that feel in life? Sometimes that's so restrictive. And sometimes there's no real prevalence of kindness and love and beauty. Much of the things in our world, they don't seem to work according to science even. I think the world is actually more run from the heart rather than um, uh, laws of this. What do they call it laws of physics? It's like they they are just um, established by some government body. And if you break a law of physics, then you get fined or have to go to jail. It doesn't make any sense, does it? But instead of like laws of physics or laws of science, that's why I love it when something happens which breaks those laws, which doesn't make any sense. But it's beautiful to see. And those are the times when you think just the human heart and mind, to see that win over this cold, hard laws is a beautiful thing to see. Now even like laws of, um, even criminal laws. Someone was telling me that they were inspired by the story. I said, I think I read this in the West Australian. There was this one judge or magistrate up north somewhere in Western Australia and they told that he had this young indigenous kid come into his court again and you know, said, you know, you've been up in front of me so many times before and now you're in for some robbery or destruction or something. And he said, look, obviously just any punishment is not working for you. So I'm going to make a suggestion to you. I know this is not according to our legal system, but if you keep your nose clean for the next six months, I don't see you in front of my court for that time, then I will buy you a BMX bike out of my own money, said the judge. And this little kid was kind of gobsmacked by that. This judge actually meant it. And it was one of the first times he'd received some kindness. And he kept his nose clean. And after six months, the judge took him to the shop and brought him out of his own money, not out of court money, out of the judge's own money, bought him his beautiful bike. And that changed his kid's life. Instead of a sentence, he got this beautiful reward. And that was something which was not following the way of the law, following the way of the heart. I don't know if you've ever experienced things like that. 
I was just talking with the monks about uh, getting something for free. Have you ever got anything for free? I remember just, I was a school teacher before I became a monk. Once I decided to become a monk, I had some worldly possessions. One of those possessions I had, I had this beautiful dining table. It's like mahogany, it's quite expensive. I was just trying to build up you know, my assets as a, a young teacher. And so I got this really high quality table. When I decided to become a monk, the people who were going to take over the schoolhouse which I was renting, then they came and had a look at it and said they liked it very much. And I said, this table is a beautiful table. I can't take it with me all the way to Thailand. What does a monk need with a dining table? We can't eat in the evening. <laughs> so anyway, they said, yes, we like that table. It's beautiful. And they said, how much? And that was one of the beautiful times in my life I remember so clearly. I said, you like it? He says, yeah, yeah, how much? I said, nothing, it's yours. I remember them looking at each other. <laughs> I said, this, this man's crazy. He's mad because no one gives you expensive stuff like that. And then I said, look, I'm off to become a monk. I don't need a table, I don't need money. It's yours, please take it. Now have a good start in your life. They were just a young couple, recently married, didn't have any kids yet, just starting off in life. And I had the opportunity, the means, to give them this beautiful piece of furniture. I said, all it cost me was nothing, but I got so much out of that. The joy of helping a couple of people I didn't know, you know start their life together. So that's the sort of thing which I search for in life, that beautiful meaning, the joy, that doing things differently. It's give people other opportunities to have wonderful experiences. And when you do stuff like that, you know, the joy, the love, the ability to love and be loved. Say, Ajahn Brahm, what are you talking about, to love and be loved? You're single, you're celibate. You know, you've never had a partner in life. Yes, I have. Each one of you. <laughs> I mean that, you're my family. And hopefully you feel that when you come and talk to me, I do actually care about you. And one of the lovely things about that, I must admit, is I've been here almost 40 years now in Western Australia. Actually over 40 years, 41 years now in Western Australia. And many of you, I've known when you were so small. You know, that your parents brought you here when you were little kids. And I always allowed you to play in the gardens. I remember, <laughs> okay, I'm telling old stories now. Like, old people do this all the time. <laughs> I'm old. <coughs> the, the first way sack <coughs> we celebrated here in Perth, in Magnolia Street Temple, that was, when was that, 1983 or four or something? But anyway, there's these kids and they were in the bushes in the front of this little house, which was our Buddhist society then, Buddhist center there, under the bushes in the afternoon, eating biscuits. And they were supposed to be on eight precepts, which was really unfair, there's only kids. And then, he said, Ajahn Brahm, please don't tell our parents we're supposed to be on eight precepts. They said, no, come on, I'll get you some more biscuits, you must be hungry. <laughs> and I said something like that to them, and they always reminded me. That actually confirmed to them the importance of kindness. And I still remember those, just seeing if any of them are here. I know one of them uh, was uh, this colonoscopist, I got it right this time, not the bum doctor I usually call him. <laughs> but when he actually, you know, grew up, you know, he went to un university, very smart kid, he wanted to do medicine, and once he did medicine, he was the fellow, he came to see me one Saturday morning. He said, I can't do medicine anymore, I have to resign. I said, why? And he said, because that morning one of his patients had died unexpectedly. 
It was not just unexpected, it was like tragically. It was a 23-year-old young woman. And this colonoscopist had to tell the husband he had no more wife. She died, you know, she wasn't expected to die. And he felt that was just so terrible, such a hard thing to do. He felt responsible. And then also had to tell the two young kids next to the husband, you've got no mummy anymore. She died. Now that may sound, you know, just ordinary to you, but to him it was just, it was just emotionally intolerable. So he said he's going to have to resign. And that's when I told him. <laughs> told him, you've heard the story before, but it's a beautiful story, it should be told again and again and again. I told him, you've, m you've misunderstood the purpose of being a doctor, or a nurse, or any type of therapist. Your main purpose is not to cure people. You'll always be a failure sooner or later if you think that's your purpose. Your main purpose is to care for people. You never need to fail when you care for people. He got it straight away. So he never resigned. He went back to work and he became a very good doctor, specialist in colonoscopy. And when any of my monks need a colonoscopy, or even, I don't mind saying this, Venerable Chanda, when she was here, last range retreat. Oh, thank you. The gods are happy. when she needed a colonoscopy, because she was um, at the end of her stay here, she had a ticket to go back to UK in a couple of weeks, or three weeks, and just to get the public system, you know, she, you can't get that that fast, you know there's always a waiting list. So you rang up, I shouldn't say this, my disciple colonoscopy, yeah, we'll sort that one out. <laughs> so she got a special colonoscopy to make sure that she was okay, wasn't any cancer there. And that's the sort of thing which people do, the gratitude they have. You help them, you know, big time, keep his career on track, and they help you back. It's a beautiful way of doing things. So this is actually how uh, we understand about this caring and not curing. And that's a beautiful thing to have that type of wisdom. That's what we're searching for. You know, your partner in life, do you really care for them? I ask this seriously, your partner, you may have lived with them for quite a long time, how many of you can say to them, or have said to them, you know, partner, the door of my heart will always be open to you no matter what you ever do. To give what we call unconditional love. Have you ever received unconditional love from somebody? If you do it, it's something so incredibly special. My father did that to me when I was 14 years of age. And I never forgot that. That was one of the reasons I'm a monk today. Beautiful uncle, whatever you do in your life, son, whatever you do, the door of my house, he said, but he meant his heart, will always be open to you. When you receive something like that, you understand what people search for in life. And when you can say that to yourself, you look at yourself in a mirror, and you say, me, this person I've lived with all my life, you know yourself better than even your partner does. Me, the door of my heart is open to me. I make many mistakes, but nevertheless, I will never feel angry at myself. I'll never get depressed at life. Because that kindness and that love which you give to yourself can overcome almost anything. That's kind of what people are searching for in life. That is like truth, not as a theory, not as something written in a book, 
but something you feel in your heart that feels beautiful and inspiring. And the forgiveness. How many of you would love to be forgiven? Please forgive yourself. You're the only one who can do it. You look yourself in the mirror, all my faults, all my silly actions, all the terrible jokes which I've inflicted on you, not just once, but many times, sometimes on consecutive weeks. <laughs> all those silly bad jokes. I ask your forgiveness. And of course, when you have the kindness there, that it's so easy to forgive and so beautiful to forgive. There was this one lady who used to come here years ago and she had a cancer, she wanted me to teach her meditation, which I did, but the cancer was very advanced and eventually she passed away. But before she passed away, here in the reception area, I was counselling her and I asked her, what is the worst thing you've ever done in your life? And you know, she was maybe in her late 60s, 70s. She's a very sort of prim and proper lady. And she said, I can't tell you. <laughs> I said, look, I won't tell anybody else. I admit it, I lied, because I've told so many people, I'm going to tell you now as well. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think she would mind. <laughs> What's the worst thing you've ever done in your whole life? And eventually she just, okay, because she trusted me. I'd shown her some unconditional kindness so she could let me know. And she said, the worst thing I ever did in my whole life was I kissed another woman's husband. And I said, is that all you've done? <laughs> I, d I don't agree upon that. That's not a good thing to do. But that's, that's pretty good. 60 or 70 years of life, that's all you've ever done wrong. <laughs> But what I noticed though, when she kept it to herself, it was her secret for so many years, it became so big for her. She was so ashamed of it. And all she needed to do was tell a monk and it felt so much better. I put it in perspective. If that's the worst you've ever done in your whole life, that's, that's not that bad, is it? <laughs> I'm not saying that as a Buddhist, now you can kiss other people's husbands. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, you can see that some of these advice can be misinterpreted, which is some of the reasons why that sometimes I think, well, if they really get misinterpreted and you sue me for some bad teachings or whatever, thank you. Because this is what happened to that monk. He spent two years in jail in Thailand, this senior monk. And he always quoted that as the best two years of his life. So going on a retreat for 10 days, what I did at the beginning of this year, that's pretty good. But two years of having nothing to do, no one can ask you any questions, you don't have to go and do a ceremony here, you're in jail, you can't go anywhere. You just read books, meditate, rest, and he's still got good enough food. He actually probably got better food in jail than you get in monasteries. Maybe I don't know these days. But anyway, <laughs> he said it was a wonderful time and eventually he got exonerated and you know, he, he always thought that was a lucky thing to be put in jail for two years. So can you please call the police and get me arrested and I can have a real retreat for a couple of years? I don't know for what but I'm sure you can make up something. <laughs> <laughs> So what we're doing there is what you really want, you want peace, freedom, kindness, respect, love, and especially to be able to love oneself unconditionally, no matter who you are. And that's one of the reasons why I love being a monk. Somehow or other, you know, honestly, I'm being honest with you, sometimes I still can't figure it out, you know, why people want me to go to the house for a dana, what they want me to go and to this place or that place. But this is something which keeps staying with me, and I think you all know I've said it before, was that one of the best compliments I ever got in my life. I'm not doing this to praise myself, but just to show what's really important in life. That was from a, from a prison officer. 
He said, Ajahn Brahm, can you please come back to teach in our jail? That was in Canning Vale, the high security jail which was there. They've got many jails there now, they keep changing their names. But anyway, I said, well, I'm too busy now. I've got to go overseas, abbot of a couple of monasteries. And they said, no, can you please come? And of course I said, why? And this guy said, I've been working in the prison service in Western Australia all my life. I'm about to retire. And he said, I've noticed something special. I'm not a Buddhist, he said, but every prisoner who went to your classes, when they finished their sentence, they never went back to jail again. Zero recidivism. And even I thought, wow, what have I done? Why? An ability to be of service like that just really hit me in the heart. And I said, I'll send somebody else. He said, no, <laughs> we want you. Ah, why me? But what is it? Why could you do stuff like that? I'm not making this up. And somehow or other, you know, whenever I saw a person, that unconditional love meant unconditional acceptance. You saw much more than the crime for which they were put in jail. Some of those crimes were horrendous. But nevertheless, underneath, beyond that crime, that terrible act of violence, or uh, obsessive uh, force, rape, stealing, beating, underneath all of that there was this human being. This person, it was much more than the violence which they had done. And I could see that. And I went into the jails to teach, that's what I saw. And that's what apparently many of the prisoners saw as well. They realized they weren't a murderer. You know that story of the two bad bricks in the wall? Just because I laid two bad bricks in a wall didn't mean I had to destroy it. And that wall apparently is still there. And there's one guy in Carnot Prison Farm a year ago. He read that story. He understood it. And he said it was only two murders. Only two bad bricks. Only two murders. In other words, just because he did his two terrible crimes, it didn't mean he was a murderer. You don't need to destroy a life because a woman had kissed another man's husband. There's much more to life than that. That is how we learn how to forgive. By seeing the other person, not just as their faults, but what's more than their faults. You know, beyond that, see this human being in there, and I've never ever seen a human being who doesn't have beautiful qualities, wonderful qualities. I get into trouble like that over in Bodhinyana Monastery. So why do you ordain that person for? <laughs> you can see their goodness. There's always a lot of goodness and kindness in there somewhere. So anyway, isn't that what you're searching for? So at this conference, in UWA years ago, I told this intellectual, Frank Brennan, that if that's what atheists, Buddhists, all sorts of people are searching for, respect, forgiveness, the ability to love and be loved, to actually serve and help in this world, and to have these beautiful friends, if that's, you can add many things to that. If that's what people search for, my friend here says, you know, everyone's searching for God, that must be what God is. I said that. And people love that idea. It never divided anybody. It united everybody in what is really important in life. That beautiful peace, freedom from fear, ability to search and find your own path and way in this world. The ability to you know, have that love, that joy, that happiness. The ability to be free. To understand what peace feels like. 
in this meditation, that's why at the very end of the meditation I ask you, how does that feel? I'm not going to tell you. I want you to feel the peace in meditation, to feel the beauty of forgiveness, to experience just the coolness of being out there in the veranda with the wind and I don't know, there's lightning outside and maybe some rain. It's beautiful to be able to feel the rain. If it was raining outside, I'd finish this talk quickly and go out and get wet. It's a beautiful feeling. So these are actually just what everyone can agree on. And when we can agree on these important things in life, then maybe we know how that third thing which that old man saw, the most beautiful music in the whole world, was not the maestro playing the violin. That third day, he experienced an orchestra. An orchestra with everyone in the orchestra being a maestro of the instrument. And then, most importantly, learning to play in harmony together. What beautiful music that is in this world. And that's actually just uh, how we can create more peace, more understanding, and less antagonism between people in our world. That's a beautiful thing and prospect which we can have. So thank you all for listening this evening. Excellent. So now we have the time for questions and maybe answers, <laughs> I hope. But sometimes we have questions from overseas, but any questions from the floor here? Actually, the floor doesn't ask questions. I said that somewhere last week. People ask questions. Yes. Bad. Uh, oh yeah, good. Yeah. Deal with people who have bad microphones. <laughs> That's us. Hey, can you shout your shout your question? Yeah, so you have to work with people with bad floors. Bad floors. Bad floors yes. What is your advice on a day-to-day basis to replace that? If you Oh, it's to see the good qualities. In other words, don't just focus on flaws. Focus on the beautiful qualities they have. And once you start focusing on those beautiful qualities, those people can see those qualities themselves. And that's when those good qualities start to grow. I call it watering the, f the, the flowers, not watering the weeds. If you focus on a person's bad qualities, the person remembers, oh, they're hopeless, they're failures, they're no good. Then they become no good people. You can focus on some of their good qualities. Now, this was the example of this when I was a school teacher. At the end of the year, I had to give out the report cards. And there was always, there's always going to be one kid who comes bottom of the class. Even if they were all Einstein level then still one has to come bottom. So I gave this report card to this kid who came bottom. And this was not a group of Einsteins, an ordinary school in uh, west of England. And this little kid, as soon as I gave him the, car the card, he came bottom, 30th out of a class of 30. You could see that he didn't expect that. You see him get depressed and also afraid. What's his friends going to say? What's his parents going to say? What's his other relations going to say? You know, he came 30th. So I had to find out a way that he could see something beautiful in himself, not just his faults. So that's when I told him, many of you know this story, I told him, look, there's something in Buddhism called the Bodhisattva. And a Bodhisattva, this is Mahayana Buddhism, is someone who sacrifices their own happiness so that their friends don't have to suffer. I said, that's you. I know you can do much better than this. I know you're much smarter than coming bottom of the class. So, you must have done this on purpose. So your friends in the class will not have to suffer what you're going to get from your parents tonight. <laughs> and he did what you're doing now. He laughed at me. He thought, this is a crazy teacher. 
but it took him out of his depression. And I just added at the end before I dismissed the class, but I said, you're only allowed to get to be a bodhisattva once in your life at school. Next year, let somebody else take that position. <laughs> and that was just a way of him seeing another part of himself. Otherwise, if you think you're a failure, you become a failure. I've seen many people like that. I was really surprised because you know, I did educational psychology before being a, a school teacher. And I sometimes wondered, some of the monks who I taught and uh, cultivated over at Bodhinyana Monastery, I asked them, did you go to university? They said, no, I never went to university. I said, why not? They're incredibly bright kids. One of them, which you will know, that he's incredibly smart. He's a great builder. And you know, you know who he is, that's Santuti over in Kusla Vihara. I asked him, why did you never go to university? And he said, because it boiled down to his grandfather, the patriarch of the family, once looked at his report card, which you know, that day was not good. And he said, you're stupid. You're a disgrace to my family. You should work harder. And he believed that assessment from someone who never really knew him. He never really tried from that point on. He thought he was stupid and that's it. That's why he developed other skills to get on in life. A very, very funny and jolly monk. You've seen Ajahn Santut, he's given talks up here. He's a great monk, but he never went to university simply because he thought he couldn't. My goodness, he could. So that's one of the reasons why if you believe what other people say about you and they're bad things, you just give up. That's why I'll tell every one of you that you know, you're a great person, you're a great doctor, you're a great um, cashier, you're a great uh, eye. Uh, spectacle cleaner, even though that's not your job. <laughs> Whatever you do, you build a person up and they actually live up to that usually. Flattery gets you everywhere. Try it. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. There's some questions from overseas now. Thank you. My question is about addiction. What can one do to help a person who's trying to get out of addictive tendencies? Of course, some of those addictions are physical, and that's tough to be able to, to get out of those physical addictions. I remember this one gentleman once, years ago, and I thought, oh, crikey, this was so sad. He wanted to get off his heroin addiction uh, at Bodhinyana Monastery. And at that time, there was not so many monks there, so we could actually accommodate him. And he was just really wanted to. And so we allowed him to stay there at Bodhinyana Monastery. His wife would come and look after him every now and again. But then while he was there, he explained to me what it's like being addicted. He said a thousand times every day, he has to say no. He just says what, yes once. And then he's back on the heroin addiction again. He said it's so hard to do. A thousand times just to say no, once say yes, and it's all for nothing. And he was doing so well for about three or four weeks, and then he said yes. And so he's back on the habit again. And that was one of the saddest things I've seen. But no one thing he did do, he got into a, a good meditation once, and I remember him coming running after me. And he said, Ajahn Brahm, I've heard you say many, 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 many times that the joy of meditation is better than, please excuse me, sex, orgasm. I can say that. <laughs> and I've said that many times before. I wasn't always a monk. I had a girlfriend before I became a monk. I knew what I was giving up. But the joy of meditation is much better than that. 
and it's, it lasts longer, it's more pleasant, more joyful. And he was saying, I've heard you say that before, Ajahn Brahm, but I never heard you, I don't think I've heard anyone say that the pleasure of that meditation is better than heroin. He said, it is. And I thought, my, keep on that meditation going, you know, past that addiction, but he couldn't keep it up. It's interesting. But anyway, obviously the first thing about addiction is allow yourself to fail. Don't think that you said yes once, which means you can't do it. Try again, and again, and again, and again. It's worth it. The other thing is to make sure that you, you move away, if at all possible, from those sources of supply, the old friends, the telephone numbers, or places, you know you can find some of these stuff which addicts you. But never ever feel bad about yourself. Because as soon as you get into negativity about yourself, say I'm a hopeless person, it's like you don't want to try anymore. And that's one of the worst problems. Doesn't matter how many times you fail, keep trying again. You're not a bad person. I think the only bad people are the ones who supply those stuff. Anyway, when I want to do something like art, I just don't start it because I want to do things perfect. And the fear not to make it, make it holds me back. Can I use Buddhism to overcome that? Yes, of course you can. That's the, perf the perfectionist syndrome. And that was, I, I don't know if you read the article by Michelle Obama. You know, she was an amazing first lady in the United States. But her perception of her conduct or her performance was always say, I'm not really good enough to do this job. Everyone else thought she was great. And that's when I first understood about this perfection, a hindrance. You may not think it's perfect, but other people love it. As I said, that's why I get surprised sometimes that so many people come to listen to my talk when it's probably the same old talk again and again and again. You still come back to listen. Why? Because if I look at my talk and I think, oh, that was, that was a pity ordinary, I could do better than that. That's how I feel sometimes. Just like Michelle Obama. So criticize yourself way too much, instead of seeing the positive side in yourself. If you can see the positive side in yourself, life is much, much better. So you give it a try. You can't do things perfect. That's why I also said the 70% rule. As long as it's 70% and people think, okay, 70%, it's not perfect, but it's good. And then, where you make mistakes, that's where you learn, where you can grow, where you can see more in life if it's something like art. You can grow more by seeing the good you've done and not getting dissatisfied because of the mistakes. Okay, could you give some advice on repeated mistakes and heedlessness? <laughs> A lot of times, what was this story? I remember reading this in the Cancer Association's journal. There's a person walks down the street and they fall in a hole. And it's, you know, it's just really muddy hole, dirty, it takes a really lot of effort to get out of that hole. So the next time they make a resolution, I've got to be more heedful, and they walk down that street and they still fall in that hole. And they say, oh, I'm a terrible person. The third person, the third time, they go down that same street and now they really are heedful. So they walk around the hole. And the last person, the wisest of them all, never walks down that street. They take a different route <laughs> to where they want to go. So, you repeated mistakes, you make a mistake. Please never think you're a bad person. Is there anyone in this room who's never made a mistake in their life? You've all made mistakes? I may even make some stupid mistakes sometimes. But this guy, he's, he's not here today, but I saw him last week. And I was just saying he was just going over to Indonesia. And so, you know, 
he knows me. So I said, I've just heard this new marriage joke. And then his face just you know, went really, he didn't want to listen to me. He said, I'm going to Indonesia because I'm getting married. <laughs> and I was going to say a marriage joke to him. <laughs> so that ruined that relationship for a while. <laughs> But I make mistakes, <laughs> and sometimes that's, that's life, making mistakes. And that's why I also said, is anyone uh, here whose name is Jack? Any Jacks here? You're Jack over there, oh yeah. Please make sure that you never go on aircraft with a friend. They'll say, hi Jack. And then they go out of the plane. <laughs> That's another Ajahn Brahm bad joke. Anyway. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I feel that I'm lazy and not able to arouse energy practicing meditation or reading sutra at free time. Instead, I'm looking for distractions online. Appreciate your advice. Whenever you do meditate, at the very end of the meditation, please ask yourself, how is this? How does it feel? You know, when I did that as a young man, even what I thought were bad meditations were actually really much better than when I started. I always made some progress. Maybe not just brilliant lights and blissing out, but it was much more peaceful. When I started seeing the value in meditation, then it made it more enjoyable and I did more meditation. It's valuing it, seeing the value in it. And when you see the value in it, you don't be critical of yourself, but just see how it makes you more peaceful, more energetic, healthier. Then it's obvious that this is a good thing for you. And if you're living in a family, ask your wife, or your husband, or your kids, and this has happened so often in the past. People would tell me they never felt like going to the meditation class tonight. Their kids sent them. Mummy, are you going to meditation? No, I've just come back from work, I feel tired, I'm exhausted. Mummy, you must go to meditation tonight. Why? Because you're a much nicer mummy when you come home from meditation. And so many kids tell their mummy to do meditation or tell their father to do meditation. It does make you feel so much better and the kids can see that. Once you see its value, then of course it's easier to do more of it. Okay, now is there any more questions from here before we finish off? From the floor? Rather from the seats, the cushions. Oh, you got a question there. Just running in the last moment. Very good. Hi, thank you. My question relates to the story you were talking about where the farmer went to where oh, his yeah. daughter was studying and then he saw an orchestra instead. Yeah. Can you just expand on that metaphor? Oh, it's a beautiful metaphor. Sometimes we judge people and it's really unfair. They're just starting to learn. There's, you know, you're starting maybe to meditate. Don't judge yourself harshly. After a while, I wish you could have, judging me as a teacher. <laughs> I remember this lady, still a really good friend, uh, Angie Monksfield was her name. And you know, she first saw me in Singapore giving talks. And you know, that, you know, she really wanted to promote this and she was just a very, very smart woman. But then she came over to Bodhinyana Monastery just for a self-retreat in those days. And she looked in our library and decided to get the oldest talk which I've ever given. And it was one of the cassette tapes. We had a cassette tape recorder. And she listened to that, you know, the earliest, the oldest talk she could hear from me. And then after listening to that talk, she came up to me and said, look, I just found this talk. You gave this talk maybe just in the first year you came to Perth. And she said, it's amazing. I said, really? It was so hopeless. 
If I'd have heard that, I'd have walked out the door straight away. <laughs> and I said, yes. If you'd have judged me when I first started learning how to give talks, then of course you'd walk out the door. But now I'm a popular teacher. Where did that come from? From understanding, you do learn these musical instruments. Whatever you're doing in your life, to learn to be a woman, to learn to be a human being, to learn to be a man, a kind man, learn to be a husband, learn to be, I don't know what else you do in your world. It takes a lot of learning to be able to do this beautifully. And it's nice to see that everybody has to start, you know, from being a novice and being very clumsy at what you're doing. Even like an artist, you start, you know, you just don't know really what you're doing. And after a while you get that confidence. And so these days, I tell the monks this, I try to get what they call in the zone. Once you get in the zone, you start giving a talk and you just the talk comes out. I do this especially when I give monks talks and I have a monastery and the nuns come as well. And then, why? How come that comes out so easily? You get into this zone and just things come out and it becomes very inspiring. Uh, honestly, that sometimes when I give a talk to the monks, sometimes I thought, well, where did that come from? That's inspiring. The last talk I gave to the monks was yesterday, last night. And I thought, oh, no way I can give a talk tonight. I've just come off retreat, I'm just too peaceful. But he gave a talk and then it was a nice talk. And I don't know about, you heard that last night, Nicholas, and so did you. But I was really inspired by that. Is that sort of narcissistic, being inspired by your own talk? And that was actually real, I couldn't stop it. Yeah. It was just beautiful. And, and it wasn't me, I didn't give the talk. It just came out. You get into that the zone, and all you've heard, all you've meditated, all you've read, all you've learnt, you know, if it comes out by itself. And those are the best talks. So anyway, that's actually when uh, you become a maestro. But all maestros start off just making terrible noises. And that's what I did anyway. I'm glad you never... I think all those tapes have been destroyed now, it's a shame. Because they were on cassette tape and people didn't think they were worth keeping. They've been great to keep. Give everyone else confidence. You know, some of the monks tell me, you must have been born like this. I wasn't born like this. That's one of the reasons, okay, you're hanging out here. Do you think I was really a, a very pure, perfectly behaved young kid when I was growing up? One of the things I like telling people, <laughs> when I was about seven or eight years of age, I got my mother a birthday present. So I had enough pocket money, I had a little box, I had some wrapping paper, what I put in the box, this was in West London, and there was a craze, a food craze, only lasted about a year and a half, of uh, mashed potato with jellied eels. Eels. So I went to the shop, I didn't know any better, and I bought a live eel. They sold them, you could buy them live. <laughs> And I bought a live eel and put them in this cardboard box. I wrapped it up with uh, <laughs> happy birthday paper <laughs> with a nice bow on it. I wanted to sort of you know, make it sort of believable. And a nice little card. Happy birthday, mummy, from your son, Peter. That was my name. And I gave it to my mother. I must have been a very good actor because she didn't suspect a thing. Ah, oh, how sweet. A surprise birthday present from my little seven or eight year old son. And then she read it, ah, oh, that's so nice. Thank you so much. And she opened it up. And when she opened the lid of the box, the eel, I could not have trained it better. <laughs> it lifted up its head and stared at my mother. 
And mother, my mother screamed her head off. <laughs> my poor mother. And I just, I had planned it all out. I ran away to hide for a couple of hours. <laughs> I had what they call these days the exit strategy. <laughs> so that's what a sweet and beautiful young man I was. <laughs> But I'm so young. And to this day I feel a lot of compassion for mothers. Sometimes your, your children do that. And my mother, she never punished me for that. You know, she kind of understood this was just a son growing up, made a mistake, but she loved me more than she got upset at me. And that really inspired me. That's what I remembered from that. I did actually ask her, what do you do with that eel? And so she actually put it down the toilet so I can go into the sewer system. No, you had many of its friends down there, I'm sure. The sewage system down there wasn't, wouldn't kill it. It would just actually, you know, probably hang out down there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was concerned, what have I done to my mother and the poor eel? It was funny at the time. But okay, so I wasn't born a monk. You actually grew into the role. And I like telling people about imperfections. It gives people like hope. With all your imperfections, I don't know what they are. But you know, you're really nice, beautiful people. And so thank you for being here. And thank you for coming to our Buddhist Society of Western Australia again. And hopefully you come back many more times so we can enjoy each other's company. Thank you for coming. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to bow to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we can go back and see what we need to do tonight. Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami. <laughs>